Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Ag Communication webinar on shooting photos for NDSU use. This is certainly not going to be a professional, technical, how to shoot photos, but more composition is what we're going to focus on. So we want to just share with you some of examples and how we use those photos. So the first thing I'm going to do is go right to my desktop and go to the slideshow. So Elizabeth is going to help me here at the end especially, but first of all, I want to say I am not a professional photographer. Yes, I took one photo class in college and I love to shoot photos, but I didn't want a professional photographer doing this session because then you would go, oh yeah, you know, his photos are beautiful. I can't do that. Most of the photo examples in this PowerPoint are from contributions from staff. And just to tell you, I have forgotten 99% of which staff gave them to me, which is not good either. But so I can't give credit or blame for the photos. But we're going to focus on photos for NDSU publicity, not beautiful award-winning photos, but photos that we can use to market NDSU agriculture and extension. Why? Very selfishly, because ag communication needs your photos. We use photos in things like annual highlights, news releases, social media posts, publications, the NDSU homepage, and the NDSU app. Let me just show you. Annual highlights every year. We're looking for photos to, again, tell the story of research and extension. News releases. This one, obviously, we didn't shoot. It came from the scientists, but Many of you may not realize our news releases often have photos with them. We try to provide the media with photos. Social media posts. Here's one that Kelly put up on the Extension Facebook site and all the research shows people will look at social media posts more if there's a photo to go with them. Publications. So often we're told, hey, illustrate this with this or that, where a real photo can tell the story. Now that's sometimes hard depending on the subject matter, but here was one good example where Tom Shearer took these photos and it really tells and shows how to plug an abandoned well. One thing we need to work on is the NDSU homepage. I hope you all realize that they focus on the student-focused land grant and research university areas on the NDSU homepage, and University Relations has begged us to provide more land grant stories. Excuse me. <coughs> Their definition of land grant is pretty much anything that goes off campus. So this is what's being illustrated as land grant right now. And obviously NDSU Agriculture and Extension is the epitome of the land grant definition. So we need to shoot photos and have stories to go with those obviously for the NDSU homepage. They're, I'll just say it, pretty picky because obviously this is the front door to NDSU. So they used to need to be really high quality photos and there needs to be some space on them like this one has to put the title. But we need your photos and stories for the NDSU homepage, especially the land grant. I bet a lot of you don't even know about the NDSU app, but they need photos and stories for that too. The ironic part is obviously the website is horizontal and the app is vertical. So we need you to turn your camera all different ways to shoot photos for both of those NDSU needs. Can any of you think of any other things we might use photos for, for promoting NDSU agriculture and extension? And since I'm sharing my desktop, I can't see my chat pod right now. So if you would speak up instead of typing, any other ways that we can use photos? For Facebook 
blogs? Well, that was social media. Yep. Social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those social media. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Flyers, posters, brochures. Duh. I can't believe I didn't list those. Absolutely. Brochures, flyers, posters, all that stuff. Other ideas of where you can use photos? Too often we just quickly resort to clip art. And clip art looks a little cheesy sometimes. It's hard to find good clip art where it's so easy now to shoot a photo that I hope you'll all consider photos. So let's move on for Photography 101 here. First of all, a photo truly is worth a thousand words. I bet I've already got your attention with the photo on this page. Anybody want to guess what it is? Nobody knows? I would be clueless if I didn't know. This is in McHenry County after the Minot Mouse River flooding, and that is insulation that was left in a cornfield after the water went down. Looks pretty eerie, doesn't it? Now, without a cut line, it wouldn't mean anything, but doesn't that tell a story? How is that farmer going to clean up his field and have it ready to plant the next year with all this gunk in it? So a photo really is worth a thousand words. And that's what we're going to focus on today. How to use a photo to tell a story, not just a pretty picture, which is what we got a lot when we had the AgCom Flickr site. We got some beautiful photos, but they didn't really tell the NDSU agriculture and extension story. So the first thing I want to implore you all to do is shoot photos. Too often you as staff are busy doing your thing and we forget to shoot photos. And we especially forget to have you all in some of them. Hand your phone or camera to somebody else so you are in some of those photos. That's what we so often need is staff in action. So help us by putting yourselves in the picture every once in a while. So like I said, we're going to focus mostly on composition. We're going to talk about action, faces, meetings, Main Street, zooming and cropping with your feet, and some little added extras. So let's roll. Aim for action. I, again, I can't see the chat pod, so you're going to have to speak up. But which of these photos tells the story for you better, left or right? Right. Thank you. I was going to say that was a question. That means we need an answer. <laughs> yeah, the right one. Uh, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to do the obligatory line them up and pose them. That's what we even call the fig leaf pose there with everybody with their hands in front. But, but very selfishly, again, AgCom wouldn't be able to use that photo anywhere. It's nice to thank those people for their good work, but we wouldn't be able to use that photo for any of the purposes we mentioned earlier. Where the photo on the right, it tells a story. It shows Andy out in a potato field. The sign is even better marketing. So that's the kind of photo we're looking for that has action in it. Here's another one. Yeah, you make the kids look cute and happy on the left, but we really don't have any use for a picture of 20 kids lined up against the wall, even if they are cute, smiling kids, where the photo on the right really tells the story. Dan's digging in the dirt with those kids. I'm not sure what they're planting or anything, but it tells a story. And that's what we're trying to get the action going for. Faces. This is so important, too. This may not sound too polite, but around our office, we have the joke about the butts out of the garden photo. It is really hard to shoot photos of people working in a, a garden. I won't argue. Everybody's leaned over. That photo on the left, 
yeah, it kind of tells a story, but the one on the right tells an even better story because you can see the faces on the kids and the agent, except for the boy in the orange who's obviously not paying attention. <laughs> But it just tells a better story when you can see the kids. If I was using that photo, to be honest, I would probably crop it really tight and just have those first two girls looking at the miracle grow. So we can perform some magic like that. But it takes some effort to just think about what is the story I'm trying to tell here and how can I move just a little bit or even how can I get them to move just a little bit to tell that story and get a better photo. It's not going to be professional because, like I said, most of us aren't photography professionals, but a better photo that we can use for all those different purposes to market extension and agriculture. Another example, the one on the left, we've got the back of one guy's head and a pole going through the other guy's face. Plus it's backlit and the color is horrible. The photo on the right is excellent. I know who shot that though. That's a Dan Keck photo. He's the university photographer, but it has the backs of two people's heads, but yet it tells the story because you can tell they're learning from Bill Wilson and with the chart in the background and the computers and everything. But yet the first thing that grabs your attention is Bill's face and his hands and his animation and, and him. So that's what we're shooting for, not like what's on the left. Here's a good example. Yes, obviously I did not shoot this photo. What's the first thing you notice on the left? Anybody see it? The guy on the phone? Yes. <laughs> I wish I knew who that was at the Eden meeting. I'd give him grief next year. Uh, but yes, that's the first thing you notice. That's what's up close is the guy playing on his phone. Yeah, maybe he's doing email. We'll give him credit. We're on the right. Uh, even if the subject is questionable, you can tell that I'm presenting to a group. It doesn't have to show the back of everybody's head, but Lisa did a good job of showing me presenting to the group and the screen is even in focus enough, you could kind of tell what we were talking about. So big difference. Because meetings are one of the very, very, very hardest things to shoot. And what do we do? Meetings. So there's one example of how getting in close, and I mean with your feet, not just zooming, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but you don't have to have the backs of everybody's heads to prove that it's a meeting. What I need is all of you presenting. So I want them close like this, maybe with just a couple people so we get a little bit of a sense, but we want you in action. Here's another one. I can tell that's Jody Bruins there in the middle in the back and a bunch of people. It's nice to capture one of those for the historical records, but we really wouldn't be able to use that for any of the purposes we've talked about. Where the photo on the right is from one of the community forums and there's Sarah Lady. You can tell it's three community members discussing the importance of daycare in their community. It really tells the story, people working together on an issue. A couple more meeting pictures. Again, on the left, I can't even tell who that is. I have no idea. It's so far away, but the backs of a bunch of farmers' heads doesn't really help us much. It doesn't market extension and agriculture very well. Where on the right, yeah, you may not have the best facial expressions, but you can tell this lady has a microphone and she's sharing her idea or her opinion or whatever. And it shows that engagement. So again, examples of meetings, which are a huge challenge. Main Street. One of the hardest program areas for us to illustrate is community development. Think about it. How do you illustrate a concept like that? Well, we often go to the quote Main Street picture 
And if we want to show a vibrant community, nothing against Rutland, but this photo doesn't, ha well, I guess there's one car in the background, but it looks pretty dead there, doesn't it? The one on the bottom at least shows cars, so you assume there are people there. And I couldn't find it, but we have a photo of somebody standing in their new business door. I think it even says now open or something. So sometimes we have to pose those community development type photos. What would tell the story of community development? Maybe it's kids playing on the new playground or swimming in the new swimming pool in the town or something like that, or even just folks gathered around at the cafe. But think about how does it tell a story? I already mentioned zooming in and cropping with your feet. By with your feet, I mean moving around, not just using your camera to zoom in. Certainly, that's quality. The more you zoom in with your machine, the more you lose quality, where if you move with your feet, you get better angles and higher quality and get up close and crop it in your camera to begin with, not afterwards. So obviously the picture on the left, you have a lot of distractions on the back and the right hand side there, the ceiling and everything. Where on the right, you are zoomed in a lot more. I'm still not sure exactly what they were doing there, but you can see the action and we don't have all the distractions. Now, the ironic part of this photo is it's the exact same photo. I did have to crop it, but that shows you how if you would just step in a couple of steps and in this one, if the photographer would have stepped to the right a couple of steps and gotten more in front of the table, then you wouldn't have had to have cropped out all that excess in the background. Another example of zooming in and cropping with your feet. The photo on the left, just from where somebody was sitting, it looks like horrible backlighting. All the light is in the background. Obviously, the people wanted to be in the shade. And so the speaker is just a shadow. The people are a shadow too, but the speaker who we would wanna focus on is just a shadow. But here the photographer did a good job, well, better anyway, by just stepping around to the end instead of being behind the audience, got rid of that backlighting. At least the speaker isn't a shadow now. But it's still a lot of excess people sitting listening, but you can see the difference how just scooting over a few feet can make a huge difference. Just last week while we were on vacation, my husband was giving me grief for standing up on a rock and climbing up on a fence. And I don't remember what all else, but I'll do anything to get a decent picture. And here's an example of kids working on a project. I'm not sure what they're doing even, but chopped off their heads on the one on the left, where on the right, it looks like somebody stood up on a chair and is kind of pointing down and that crops out all the excess roof and background or ceiling rather and background and everything like that, but still got the kids faces. So that's wonderful. You can see what they're doing too. It has the action plus their faces, plus it tells the story. So just one little thing like getting up higher and shooting down or the other way around, crouching down and shooting up, not to the extent that it puts people out of proportion, but to the extent that it tells a better story. Looking for what I call extras. Anybody notice anything on the left that probably shouldn't be there? Shadow? The shadow, yes, you can see the photographer's shadow on the girl shoe, can't you? Now that could have been a tricky one, but just again, turning a couple feet the other way would have taken care of that probably. What about on the right? What jumps out at you? Or maybe it's just me, but what jumps out at you? The one on the right. You're in the way of the projector? Well, yeah, that too. But and, and like I said, maybe it's just me, but that exit sign drives me crazy. 
where if the photographer would have walked in just a couple more steps probably and gotten up higher maybe could have gotten rid of the exit sign now granted we can crop that out but again you lose quality every time you crop or make something smaller this one on the left you have to look kind of closely why would we not be able to use the photo on the left for annual highlights or something like that I see the Coors Light picture in there, Becky. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I'll we'll chop that out, but just try to catch things like that. <laughs> what about on the right? This one's not as bad, but what could have been changed to get rid of an extra there step in and get rid of the vehicle uh i didn't think of that yeah that's a possibility but stepping in definitely maybe even going a little to the left to get him a little more straight on but the angle where he's at it looks like a javelin is going right through john's head or something like that doesn't it so those backgrounds we've always seen the pictures of a bush coming right up out of somebody's head or something like that. So think about the background. So those little added extras can sometimes really goof up a good photo. Any other thoughts about composition? A again, our goal is not to teach you about apertures and f-stops and the rule of thirds and all those nitty-gritty details our goal today is to help you take photos that tell the ndsu agriculture and extension story so any other thoughts about that or questions on that before we move on to your favorite topic that you saw there already questions thoughts on composition of photos Okay, we'll keep going then. Copyright, everybody's favorite topic. Basically, documents, images, anything like that are just like other products. Somebody else created them, they own them. However, we can use documents and graphics such as photos that are from the federal government. Anything from the federal government is considered public domain. So if you go on to a USDA website or um, something like that, you can use those photos. Creative Commons, that is a copyright licensing agreement where you say, yes, I own this, but you may go ahead and use it without asking my permission. For example, all of our NDSU Ag CMS pages have at the bottom of them and all of our publications have on the bottom of them we use this Creative Commons license. You may use the content and or the photos as long as you, one, give attribution, credit NDSU in other words, preferably the author too if we know that. Two, don't sell it yourself. We've had people actually take our NDSU information and they try to sell it even when we gave it to them for free. And three, share alike, which means if you tweak our photo, you can't then say, well, nobody else can use it now. So you have to share whatever you created from our original work. A little complicated, but basically we want people to use NDSU information, including our photos, if it helps tell the story, as long as they attribute us as the source and uh, don't or, well, use the non-commercial and share alike. Fair use, that's more for written material rather than photos. If you use sections of it, a snippet of it, an example of it. It's not fair use to print 100 pages of a 120 page book. So people don't have to buy the book though, for example. And of course, the other way to get permission to use a photo or written information is to get permission. Now, granted, if you use somebody else's photo in a publication or something like that, we want to see that in your submittal form. 
we need written verification and you need written verification that somebody from another university or a pharmaceutical company or a chemical company or whoever said, yes, you may use this for this educational purpose. Uh, just to go back, this photo, you'll notice I shot it. It wasn't during work hours or anything. But this is another one where I think I had to climb up on a fence to kind of shoot down into there. But I labeled it as NDSU because, especially for extension, the university attorney has said it's a work, it's part of your job. And so we can use your photos even after you retire or leave or whatever because you've done that as part of your work. And obviously the flood work was part of my work. So rather than identify it with my name or something, usually we just say NDSU photo. I talked about the federal government and I use the FEMA website quite a bit. And they specifically say right on there, yes, you certainly may use this, please just credit FEMA. Sometimes they ask you to credit the photographer, but not always. On public photo, websites such as Flickr, there's where you have to be really careful because some photographers who upload their photos say copyrighted, all rights reserved. That means you cannot use that without permission. But a lot of the photographers do use a Creative Commons license and say, sure, you can go ahead and use this as long as you attribute the source. And most of them say don't make money off of it and share alike, just like ours, Creative Commons. So Barbara Samuels had this photo in Flickr that was Creative Commons. And so I needed to identify her as the source and where I got it. So if you just went to Flickr.com and search for Bar Barbara Samuels, you would probably be able to find this photo. I don't know. She may have 10,000 and it would be hard to find, but you could find that photo. So we have to be sure to attribute these photos. And confession time, I did not put the attributions on all the photos in the first part of this slideshow just because I forgot and I was in a hurry. But this is how I really recommend, even in PowerPoints, we attribute our photos because PowerPoints are similar to a printed publication or a website. If they say attribute the photo, we need to attribute the photo wherever it is. So it doesn't have to be very big, doesn't have to be obnoxious. In fact, if I had to do this over again, I'd probably make the FEMA and Flickr a little bit smaller. But we do need to provide that attribution if that's what is required for the Creative Commons license. Related to Creative Commons, let's talk ethics of photos just a little bit. And this is a little different than some states even. But our university attorney, I guess technically now he's the attorney general's attorney who helps us at NDSU, he has said that there is no need to get permission from people to take their photo and use it for publicity purposes if they are in a public place or a public meeting. If you know, folks are downtown or, as this photo shows, at one of our field days. Can you imagine having to get permission from each one of those guys? I guess, I think they may all be guys. Um, so I could use this photo here. But at our professional development meeting in June, somebody from, a photographer even, from University of Kentucky spoke up and he said they are required. Required. Their university attorney told them just the opposite, that they are required to have everybody who attends a meeting sign something. Now, granted, they may not even read the part at the top of the signature page that says you are giving us permission to take your photo and use it for publicity purposes, not commercial purposes. Obviously, we're not going to make money off of it, but just publicity. So we are very lucky that we don't have to do that. However, we do need to consider the situation. Obviously, a field day like this, no problem. But I remember years ago, we were doing a video about gambling 
not how to gamble, but how to break the cycle of gambling and how it can affect your family and those kind of things. So the videographers went down to Dakota Magic with the specialists and they put up police tape and had signs on the police tape that said filming in progress because that would not be cool if you showed up in a gambling video and somebody found out that you had been down at Dakota Magic. So in that case, you just try to make sure the wrong, the people you don't want are not in the photo. But think about the situation. And of course, we need to try to incorporate diversity. So think about age differences, gender differences, ethnicity differences. Try to get a variety of people in your photos. So to wrap up my part, the process, we want you to shoot basically at the highest resolution you have on your phone or on your camera. Because number one, memory cards are so humongous anymore and they're so cheap anymore. None of us really have the excuse that, oh, I'm going to run out of memory. And if you ever want to work, for example, with John Grindall to really enlarge that photo, you're going to be really disappointed if you didn't shoot it at the highest resolution possible. Everybody says, well, what should I shoot at? And our answer in AgCom is the highest you have, because then you know you can use it for anything. You might have to downsize it to put it in a PowerPoint or to email it to somebody even, but you won't be disappointed down the road if you do want to enlarge it and can't. So shoot at high resolution and shoot a lot. Again, a lot of us on this webinar are old enough to remember film. And there you were very careful with shooting because you didn't want to waste a lot of film and pay for the processing and get them back and then go, oh. But with digital, I delete half, well, maybe not quite half, probably a third. I probably delete about a third of my photos before I even download them from my camera. I, I do have a digital SLR, not just my phone. But I delete, I look at it immediately and go, oh, his eyes are closed, delete. Or, oh, I didn't see that in the background, delete and I delete them before I even download. So shoot a lot of photos and surely you're going to have some good ones. I'm going to let Elizabeth wrap up here to talk about what, how you can help now and then we'll go back to the, I'll close the desktop and we'll discuss more and take questions both from the chat pod and from audio. So Elizabeth, do you want to take it over from here? Sure. Uh, so I am Elizabeth Cronin. I'm fairly new here. Um, I'm administrative assistant for ACOM and I'm the person when you have your photos, uh, you can submit them to me. Um, but so you take your huge pool of photos um, since maybe I don't have time to go through and sift through all of the photos, if you could pick out a few that you think are the best and that help to tell the story of the event or the situation um, and send those to me, then I can go through and put them onto our photo gallery. And when you submit them, um, it would be great to have more than just, you know, we'll need, for sure we need the names of any people, their titles, the name of the event, when it happened, and just a brief description. You know, we don't need a paragraph, but a sentence that will give it a little bit of context, and not just for our use for a cut line, but for the gallery use. If someone, if you wanted to go later into our gallery and find a photo on a certain topic or uh, to use for something that, for one of your needs, um, having, when I have a description, it'll help me know what tags to put on the photo. Um, so we might put it under the folder of agents in action or staff in action. But if the person is talking, like that very first photo we looked at uh, in the potato field, I could also take it with potatoes. That way, if someone were looking for a photo of, you know, something related to potato, irrigated potato research, you know, we could, I could have that tag there as well, so it'll show up uh, no matter how you search for it.
our photo gallery at that URL at the bottom, ag.ndsu.edu slash photos, is live now. There's not much there yet, though. We will be transferring a lot of the photos out of the publications and whatever you send us. Well, I shouldn't say whatever, because when we had the Flickr site, people would upload beautiful photos. I remember we had tens and tens and tens, I won't say hundreds, of poor frost photos, beautiful frost on the trees, and beautiful sunsets, but it wasn't anything we could use to tell the story of NDSU Agriculture and Extension. So that's why we're going through Elizabeth and she can tag these photos and like she said, then you can find what you need. Anything else to add, Elizabeth? I don't think so, um, unless we want to take a look at the gallery now. Oh, I forgot about that. Let me figure out how to do that. There we go. Can you all see that? You should be able to. So we're using the same categories as we are for news releases and publications and things. So you can go, that's a long URL, but if you just go to ag.ndsu.edu slash photos and see the types of things we're starting to capture. But again, they're coming out of publications and other sources that tell the story. That's what we're focusing on. Okay, I'm going to stop presenting. And I am back, but you guys did a good job of not writing things in the chat pod that I couldn't see. So any questions, any discussion now about photography and the kinds of photos we need? Hey, I'll admit, AgCom's being a little bit selfish here. We're looking to you to help provide photos that we can use in all those different resources we talked about at the very beginning. How can we tell the story? So your feedback, questions, suggestions, additional ideas like how I spaced off, duh, publications and brochures and things like that need photos too. Banners as well. Banners, there you go. Yep, those are the ones we need in high resolution for something for John Grindall to enlarge. Mm -hmm. Becky, you have a question regarding getting receiving signature of people who are photographed. If we have youth in youth activity days or marketplace for kids, as an example, have some good action shots, but I have no idea who these children are and did not receive signatures from their parents because they aren't even there that day. Are they something that could be submitted or are they something that, no, we don't use them? Okay, first of all, let me start a little differently and get to that. 4-H members, when they enroll, you probably all know this better than I do, 4-H members do sign their enrollment that says we may use their image for publicity purposes. However, we do not identify them in the photos. That's why State Fair that just finished, that's why that's a password protected site even because that obviously has their name, their hometown and everything. But when we post a picture of a 4-H'er, we don't identify them. A, e, or Marketplace for Kids or something like that, Karen, I would check with the sponsors of the program because they have probably thought about that and you'd probably have to go with their rules, but they obviously are running around taking photos, so they must have told the teachers that, hey, we're going to do this, is this a problem? So I would check with the organizer of a program. Now, if you're organizing a program, for example, in a school, I would check with the school and see what their policy is. If you're organizing your own program that's not 4-H members who have signed the media release, you might want to have the parent sign something then just to cover your rear or you might want to feel comfortable just going with the, yeah, my kid's picture may be here, but they won't be identified. In my 
26 years here, we have never had a problem that I can remember of anybody being concerned about being in a photo. I think we're all smart enough to not take photos of questionable things. But just the average Joe Blow meeting with adults, no problem, they're in a public place. Kids work with the sponsor. If you're the sponsor, then you need to think about it. We do have a generic media release online on the ICOM website if you'd like to look at it and feel you need one like that. Okay, did that answer that, Karen? I think that was Karen anyway. Yes. Okay, thank you. What is, uh, Rebecca asked, what is everyone using, to, oh, Photoshop or Lightroom? <laughs> Uh, Rebecca, I hate to admit this, but I don't use either. If it's a crappy photo, I just don't take the time to use it. If I, if we really need to fix it, then I give it to Deb Tanner or Dave Hauser and they make it beautiful. Uh, Picasa, though, is one that we recommend. Photoshop, to be honest, for most staff, we don't recommend. It's just overkill. Photoshop is very complicated. It's expensive. I don't even know if they still make Photoshop elements or not. Lightroom, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with. There's one other one that we've talked about. Oh, shoot. Ellen or Kelly, can you remember what it is? I can't remember the name of it. Picasso is the only one I can remember. Lightroom doesn't ring a bell, so I don't think that's it. But we don't train on any of those, so it's basically whatever you find and what you feel comfortable with. Paint Shop Pro, okay. I'm again. I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> I, just, I just shoot a lot and hope one turns out. Are any of these shareware or ones that you could use for free? I know Picasa is Lightroom. I don't know. Paint Shop Pro isn't that part of Microsoft or not? Or is that just? Paint? I don't know. I'm I sorry. had to pay for mine. Uh, oh. But it's too complicated. It's to your point. It we it's it's too much for most applications. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lightroom, forty-four dollars. Thanks, Rebecca. Picasa was simple. That's kind of like Qualtrics. It used to be nice and simple. Now they've everybody has wanted all this other gunk, and it's made it complicated. Okay, well, again, this was not going to be a technical photography session. This was how to shoot photos that tell a story. So this is great discussion, though, and I'm having to admit I don't know a lot here. But any other thoughts about photos at all or what software you're using or anything? Becky, back to your comment about uh, copyright. If I take a picture and use it in a presentation, should I indicate NDSU on it? Or since it's mine, can I just say nothing? Especially if you're using it in a PowerPoint where you're not giving it to somebody else, I wouldn't worry about it. Like I said, on this PowerPoint, I forgot to go back and identify all the photos. However, if you're handing something out, especially in extension publications now, you'll notice that we're trying to identify every single photo. Because what happens is somebody will see it online and go, oh, I want to use that for this purpose, and it's a very good official purpose, but the online version isn't high enough quality. Could I use a high resolution of this picture? And we go, oh, sure. And then we go, oh, wait a minute. We're not sure we own that photo. Maybe the specialist got it from somebody else, and it's not an NDSU photo. So that's why in publications, and I encourage you on websites to list the source. Now, I kind of went crazy here a while back. We did an online class, and none of the photos were identified after some of us had gone to a lot of work to find legal photos. And some sources, I think it's Morg File, for example, and even iStock, if you buy photos, such as what Deb and Dave and Agnes do, then you don't have to give credit. But then I always wonder, oh, shoot, where did that come from? We don't know. So, like I said, often AgCom gets asked, may I use that photo? 
And if we don't know where it came from, we have to say no. I have a question for you, Becky. Uh-huh. If we had an employee that worked here for several years and during work he would go out and take pictures on station of maybe people working or out in the field or the flower beds as we're planting uh-huh. and he retired, are we still able to keep those photos for our like records? That way if we want to look back and say what did the flower beds look like at this year, we can do that? The like, y- the university attorney said yes. Okay, that's we what I question it. Now that's especially true for extension staff because developing educational materials is their job. For a researcher, it's a little bit iffier, but yet it was done as part of their work, so it's owned by the university. So okay. yes. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to double check. Thank you. You bet. Oh, man. Rebecca, you're asking some good questions. (laughs) Someone to contact to discuss options for the purchase of a new DSLR. Dan Keck, the University of Photographer, even refuses to recommend cameras. He says it depends on so many things. Uh, He's a Canon guy, I think, because mine's a Nikon, so I think I remember he was Canon. But he said it depends, and it, it, it there are just so many variables. Uh, I would just do some Googling, uh, just DSLR comparison, and lots of independent firms and magazines and groups like that have done comparisons. Um, that's when I bought mine, I just went online and said, hey, Best Buy has this Nikon on sale. Is it a decent one? And it got some really good reviews, and I've had it for years, and I love it, and I'm very happy. And it was on sale. So, you know, I I honestly do not know of anybody who's not a salesperson to send you to. I would instead do some online Googling. I would talk to Scott and Bruce, Becky. Bruce has uh, an SLR, I know. I'm not even sure Scott has an SLR. Obviously, they're more into video, but they're also mainly going to say it depends. I mean, Bruce has invested a lot in his personal equipment where I wasn't willing to invest that much. So, but I still got a really good camera. But yeah, going into a store a camera shop or Best Buy or whatever and and just playing with them. That's another good option. You're right. But face it, you guys, to be honest, probably all, most of you at least, have a smartphone with a camera that has more megapixels in it than my SLR has now. And to be honest, I hate to admit this, but I'm going to, 95% of the time I leave my SLR on automatic. Like I said, we're not going to get into aperture and shutter speeds and stuff like that. I leave leave it on automatic almost all the time. And again, the composition is more important. I truly believe the composition is more important than the kind of camera. It's garbage in, garbage out. You can have a super duper expensive camera and still get crappy pictures if you don't know how to compose a picture and tell a story. And vice versa. In fact, Annie Leibowitz, who is one of the world's renowned photographers, I saw her a clip. I didn't actually see the show, but she was on Ellen DeGeneres, I think, and was asked, hey, if you were recommending a camera to people, what would you say? And she said, the iPhone. It can do so much now. The most important camera is the one that you have with you, and that's usually your phone. even though I would like to have a new SLR. (laughs) Anything else? Anything at all about policies or procedures or composition or nothing too technical. Remember, this wasn't going to be a technical discussion. No. (laughs) Okay, well, Elizabeth put her email in there again. So if you have photos to send to Elizabeth, like she said, please include information about them. That was the other problem when we had the Flickr site. There were beautiful photos uploaded. Number one, they didn't tell the 
egg and extension story. And number two, we had if they were people or an event or whatever, we didn't know what it was. So that's why we've switched it around and we're doing it this way. So thank you all for joining the webinar today. I hope it was useful. We I did remember to record, so we'll get this uploaded to the AgCom homepage here pretty soon. Thank you very much. And if you ever have ideas for topics for future AgCom webinars, please let us know, and we'd be glad to cover different topics. So thank you so much for joining us today. Bye.